Now, the urgency of sociology is to understand social reality, especially those morally reprehensible parts that we fervently oppose and wish to change. Sociology is defined morally by the evils it opposes and exposes. The chosen weapon of sociology is realism. The discipline insists that our theories reflect reality, that they allow us to see things as they actually are, that the methods we employ are rational and reasonable. While I share this moral outrage and the urgent need to change the world, I will propose in this brief talk that realism can paradoxically also be a great danger to sociology. As method, as theory, and also as sensibility, realism actually can make it difficult for us to be realistic. To put it most provocatively, realism can make reality obscure. Sociologists often envy and try to imitate the extraordinary lucidity and realism of the hard sciences. Perhaps if we work hard enough, we can match their ability to mirror the structure of the world. So in qualitative work, we talk about observational methods and worry about converting impressions into field notes and generating grounded theory. In quantitative work, we diligently convert social qualities into countable things to ensure our indicators have statistical validity and to separate spurious correlations from robust causality. I would by no means gainsay such efforts, but I do wish to challenge the worldview of realism to which they are typically attached. An obsessive concern with observation, induction, and reflection makes us blind to the role that moral and intellectual imagination play in generating important sociological findings. And not just in generating findings, but in feeling and believing these findings to be true. I'm pointing here to the independent role of theory, to how it inspires observation, and interpretation and is intertwined with them forever after. Because strictly speaking, we do not observe actions, record events, or compile data about social structures. What we do is to make interpretations of actions, events, and structures in light of our theories, our more general presuppositions about how people act what events are like, how social structures feel, and what they're made of. If we say we are interpreting, then sociology is not a reflection of reality, but a reconstruction of it in light of theory. What we are actually doing as sociologists is making meaning. Observations provide us with ways to exemplify, specify, and revise ideal theoretical types Empirical phenomena provide new notes that we usually play on familiar chords. Sometimes they provide new chords to play in a familiar key. Only on the rarest of occasions do they lead us to play in an entirely new key. Gender was not, quote, discovered by sociologists until the late 60s and 70s, but it had always been there. It just had not yet been seen. Gender could not be observed until second wave feminist theory emerged, which was inspired by existential philosophy, black civil rights, and the new left. Only after the formation, in other words, of feminist presuppositions could sociology see the meaning of patriarchy. Only after sociology went looking for gender could it be discovered. Sociologists do not only enlighten modern men and women by discovering objective facts about the world, but by offering people new theories. Social theories draw new binaries between pure and polluted. They define new oppressors and new heroes. They create new narratives about the relation of the past to the present and how to get 
to a better future. They sketch out a new arc of history so we can reimagine the world and act in more energetic and more energizing ways. Social phenomena do have an independent reality, of course, but they do not themselves speak. They must be made meaningful before they can be heard. It is through social theories that social meanings are made. Social facts are signifieds of the social signifiers we call theories. This is a cultural understanding of the science of sociology. Theories are cultural structures. Even if realism ignores them, making them invisible, it is these theoretical culture structures that provide the background references that establish the broad meanings of social things. Visible social facts, the actions we see, the events we record, the data we compile, are not things, but signs. The fact sign is composed of invisible theoretical signifiers and visible empirical signifieds. To produce fact signs is to bring together the theoretical concepts of our imaginations with events in time and place. Fact signs seem objective and realistic, but they actually are built up from our imaginative encounters. Class, for example, is never seen as such, nor is race. Imagining class responds to real inputs from time and space, from the world outside us, but the fact sign class is elastic and imaginary, twisting and shifting in the history of sociology in response not only to social changes, but to what we theoretically imagine class to be. Cultural sociology begins with the idea that everyday actors engage social reality in the same way as sociologists. If scientifically trained social scientists do meaning making and not only observation, if the data of rational sociologists is not mirrored but constructed fact sign, then how can everyday social actors without scientific training engage reality in a purely realistic and rational manner? Wittgenstein paved the way for cultural sociology with his late linguistic turn. The meaning of a word cannot be derived from the reality of its referent from what it really is. What really is, what's out there, cannot be understood without placing it inside of the conventions of our language games, which are in here. What we understand, Wittgenstein teaches us, are the public and social representations of things, not the things in themselves. Cultural sociology reconstructs the sociological equivalence of language and finds out how they work and change. What are gendered persons and how do they act? Can I find out simply by observing men and women, by recording data from these observations and inductively concluding this is a woman, this is a man? Fifty years ago, people did think about gender in this way, but it would seem ludicrous to do so today. The meanings of gender persons change. What we think today when we see the bodies of women and men was once unseeable. Gendered bodies are signifieds of social signifiers. They are fact signs or culture structures. Feminism is a cultural system, a set of signs, a new way of drawing boundaries, of separating pure from impure, of naming new villains and heroes, of telling new stories about the past and future. Feminine, feminism has been imagined by intellectuals and artists with such creativity and skill and performed by social movements with, with such persuasive force that gendered people are now made meaningful in a different manner. 
when contemporary sociologists describe gendered persons and how they act, our fact signs will be different because our theories have changed. To suggest that cultural representation have independence from the things they describe is to distinguish long from parole, the distinction so sore made between language as structure and language as action or speech act. When I speak, I refer to particular things out there, expressing my intentions and pointing to real objects in time and space. But my speaking can only be made sense of inside the invisible structure of the language that I'm speaking, which establishes the broad meaning of what I am able to say. In 1963, Martin Luther King led the March on Washington, demanding justice for black Americans. The civil rights movement called for legal, political, and administrative radical change. These demands for justice were eloquent and powerful speech acts. Listeners could make sense of them, however, only inside an encompassing language of citizenship that intertwines autonomy and solidarity in a sacred discourse of liberty. The black movement for civil rights was a new improvisation, in other words, on a venerable chord. It deployed the liberating binary of slavery versus freedom that had structured the discourse of the workers' movement a century earlier, of the American and French revolutions a century before that, of early modern Europe's Republican city-states and of the English barren struggle that forced King John to sign the Magna Carta centuries before that. Perfect. If cultural meanings are not derived referentially from the nature of things, but from the broader language that speakers bring to bear on things, then meanings are relational. We don't know what A is without comparing it to B. Social meanings are binary, composed of analogies and antipathies, black and white, day and night, hot and cold, fast and slow high and low, sharp and dull, each term gains meaning only in relation to another that is coded as its opposite. Until recently, for example, the social meanings of race in the U.S. were established by a rigid binary, one that collapsed infinitely varied skin pigmentation into two categorical colors, white and black, which had nothing to do with reality but with the fact that the binary relationship was white and black. It had nothing to do with the actual color of skin. Associating the former white with the sacred and the latter with the profane. This binary made powerful meaning, intertwining with economic, political, religious, and sexual power to structure social relationships in horrendously restrictive ways. Black and white proletariat and bourgeoisie, male and female, straight and gay, thin and fat, able and disabled, smart and dumb. All of these binaries have formed extraordinarily powerful social languages of sacred and profane. Real societies are deeply structured by imagined binaries that organize difference and define the meaning, location, and stakes of social boundaries. This imaginative structuring and its social effect are the topics of cultural sociology. Cultural sociology decenters realism, tearing away the gauze of comforting naturalness that social life wraps around social structure and social belief. Cultural sociology looks behind the visible. It searches out the invisible culture structures, the meaning references, the signifiers, for which society produces an endless stream of seemingly realistic signifieds. 
Culture structures constitute the inner reality of society that make possible the shaping power of things. Let's consider hierarchy. As sociologists, we pay extraordinary attention to the vertical. Our central traditions describe fields of conflict between higher and lower classes, genders, races, ethnicities, religions, rulers, and subalterns of every kind. Domination and subordination are held to constitute the distribution of real things, of money and power, of the material instrumentalities that hierarchy establishes and controls. But what if these vertical relationships are seen in relation to an imagined series of horizontal relationships that are egalitarian, moral, and reciprocal, which create not domination, but solidarity? In the course of my own research and theorizing, I have come to believe that this is, in fact, the case. An empirical world of ideal solidarity exists in the collective consciousness. And in every local, national, regional, and global society, it is an immensely powerful social fact. I call this imagined yet powerfully real world the civil sphere. Inside every modern society, particularly those with democratic aspirations, civil ideals, and institutions continuously question the moral validity of material hierarchies. Legitimacy depends on whether or not these so-called realities of social stratification and domination can be construed and imagined in a more civil way. People on the top see themselves as civil and describe those below as decidedly less worthy, For the bourgeois, the proletarian is shiftless, untrustworthy, prone to passion and indolence. For the dominant racial group, non-whites are dependent and childlike, aggressive and wily. For the Christian core group, Jews were the conniving enemies of civilization, greedy, often murderous, dishonest, clandestine and secretive. Patriarchal men signified their wives, mothers and daughters as weak, not strong, dependent, not autonomous, emotional, not rational, hysterical, not controlled, skillful in art, but not up for the rigors of math or science. For radical Islamicists, every dissenter to the faith is an uncivilized barbarian or infidel. Everywhere, vertical control, in other words, is nested inside a binary language that creates boundaries between the civil sphere and the uncivil profane in a very restrictive manner, naturalizing hierarchy and legitimating domination. The civil sphere, in other words, is not nearly as kindly and benevolent as the liberal tradition has typically made it out to be. Its horizontal solidarity tends to be limited to insiders. Outsiders are not said to possess civil qualities, and so they can be excluded. Indeed, they must be, for they cannot be trusted to behave in a democratic and civilized manner. The discourse of civil society is binary. It constructs motives, relations, and institutions in an either-or, pure and dirty, good and evil, deserving of salvation versus condemned to damnation, all or nothing way. This intertwining of vertical society and binary culture seems like the kind of heads I win, tail you lose, self-perpetuating, reproducing system imagined by Franz Kafka, Joseph Heller, and Pierre Bourdieu. It actually is nothing of the kind. In the discourse of civil society, the meanings of sacred civility and profane barbarism, the meanings of those are established by the internal structure of the cultural language game itself, not by the actual relations of social groups. We know what rational and irrational, selfish and altruistic, open and secretive, autonomous and independent mean. What we don't know is how they are socially applied in a particular society at a particular time. The long-standing, structure, the long-standing culture structure of civility versus barbarism 
has relative autonomy, in other words, vis-a-vis -vis, vis the current occupants of social structure. And this is where social movements, intellectuals, artists, political leaders, and culture creators come in. For example, the working class movement arises and argues that they, not the property, are independent, rational, and possess of a sense of moral right. They portray the bourgeoisie as immoral, secretive, lazy, and unworthy of their privileges. The now polluted upper class can be taxed as a result, and sometimes their property can be expropriated. They can be demoted from inherited social positions and disciplined by a social democratic state. And that's happened. Radical feminists challenge mas masculine virtue by calling it patriarchal, which is to pollute it in terms of the binary discourse of civil society. Men are now dominators, not providers, egotistical and power hungry. Their libidos are out of control. Their rationality is limited. Women are better carriers of virtue and morality, and they deserve to hold power, not men. We will all be better off if women can gain control of our economic and cultural institutions or even our states. Bringing critical culture structures to bear on social inequalities doesn't have to be done in an antagonistic manner. It does have to be agonistic, but not antagonistic. Both sides, not one, can be made civil and social solidarity extended via reform. For example, the American Civil Rights Movement eschewed black power. Martin Luther King spoke of the beloved community, of making American society whole again, of being judged, as he declared in that march on Washington, not, quote, by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. King evoked anti-civil pollution against Southern white racists, but not against the white citizens of the American North. While Iran's insurgent Green Movement condemns government leaders as frauds, torturers, and killers, and organizes mass, massive street demonstrations against them, they call for their opponents to be legally prosecuted, not to be murdered, and for new elections, not for the violent overthrow of the state. Last month, the opposition leader Mir Hussein Mousavi posted this message. Quote, the Green Movement is a civil movement which rejects aggression in every area. This movement believes that the people will always be the victims of aggression and holds that dialogue, peaceful resistance, and non-aggression are the only inviolable solutions. Reformist social movements engage, enlarge the moral imagination of our societies. They shift the relation between civil signifier and social signified. They create a new world of fact signs that expands solidarity and diminishes social domination. Time magazine made Martin Luther King its man of the year. Four years later, a southern white man assassinated King, but in the decades that followed, northern whites constructed him as a great hero, the most powerful collective representation of American civil virtue of the 20th century. His birthday became a national holiday, the first since Abraham Lincoln's 150 years before. Forty years after his death, King's spiritual descendant, Barack Obama, became the most powerful person in the United States. Symbolic inversion does not operate only inside the Lockean state. It can be projected globally and help repair the Hobbesian war of all against all. Fierce national dictatorships can be challenged in the court of world opinion. Colonialism was, not, was a moral, not only a material order. It justified harsh control in the name of a civilizing process, promising to transform barbarians so that they could enter civil society. So the struggle against colonialism was a moral movement that issued a civil challenge, not only a political movement of power or a movement of arms. Mahatma Gandhi was a brilliant strategist, 
but he was also a great social dramatist who performed an awesomely inspired spiritual and humanitarian script. He led symbolic crusades and preached nonviolence and espoused the goodness of all mankind. Whoops. Okay, I'm coming to the end. Last page. Colonizers found themselves on the short end of the moral stick. Passionately confessing civil values, they were shamed, not only physically injured and bankrupted, but humiliated in a cultural way. The worldwide movement that defeated apartheid in South Africa can be understood in a similar manner. Afrikaners held total material power inside their state, and their racist culture provided them with a vivid sense of civil superiority. But while they could lock Nelson Mandela up on Robben Island and throw away the key, the masters of apartheid could not control the process of symbolic signification. Over three de decades, the African National Congress, the Worldwide Council of Churches, liberal socialist and communist parties, white anti-racist liberals, and notably the Swedish social democratic state, fought and won the battle of world public opinion. Symbolic pollution materialized into economic boycott and eventually into the worldwide divestment movement and the Afrikaner elite, for the sake of its material self-interest, had to give way. I began this talk by warning against the metaphysics of realism in sociology. I suggested that empirical phenomena are fact signs, that they are imagined as much as they are observed, that they are the products of sociological meaning-making triggered by the cultural language of theory. If such a cultural perspective liberates the sociological imagination inside our discipline, so does it demonstrate the emancipating power of culture to dispute domination in the world at large. Cultural sociology shows that social reality is also imagined and that its injustices can be transformed in a utopian way. Thank you.